All right, what's happening, y'all? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores. What's happening, y'all? Man, good win against the Panthers. I barely got to see much of the game live. I've been down bad all weekend. I didn't even see a single play from my Georgia Bulldogs, so I have to go back and watch that. But I've already gone back and watched the full Panthers game front to back a couple of times. And this is my after the film review for the Washington football team versus Panthers game. Again, big dub. I'm really happy. Y'all know with these reviews, I got to go position group by position group and also talk about coaches as well. And then I'm going to give y'all a bunch of random advanced stats and grades and all the type of stuff throughout the video and at the end of the video and a lot of my opinions on various things. So I'm getting better. I'm almost there. Still don't want to be under like crazy bright lights. That's why I'm recording this video in this format. But at least I'm good enough to make some videos, man. And before we dive into this review, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell next to the subscription button so you get a notification immediately and every time i release an informative and opinionated video just like this one make sure you check out the rest of the channel all of my videos are organized in playlists i even have a comedy playlist follow my funny videos and i pledged to do daily uploads but then i got hit with the whoop de whoop but now i'm back so y'all about to get these daily uploads for the unforeseeable future and we gotta enjoy this win for a couple of more days and then it's time to move on to the seahawks let's get it All right, so we always got to start with the quarterback in every one of these videos. And the Taylor Heineke experience has been crazy because, I mean, I was even a little surprised that he was still the starter coming off of the bye week. Out of all of the options we had, I preferred him, but I would not have been surprised if he got benched coming outside of the bye week. And so then he decided to put together two straight best game of his career games. So as soon as he faces the most adversity he's faced, I mean, literally against the two best defenses we've probably played all season, he wants to decide to play his best games. He went 16 for 22 for 206 yards, three touchdowns, and no turnovers. And unlike last week against the Buccaneers, where he had quite a bit of turnover-worthy plays, like interceptions would just simply drop, against the Panthers, he was actually just straight up protecting the ball and just playing better, period. And of course, the best play he probably had the entire game, probably his best play of his career, you could argue, was that fourth and three where he was just trying to make anything shake and as he's being brought down hit John Bates for the first down I mean that play was crazy and many of y'all may not know but pro football focus also loved what Heineke did against the Panthers on Sunday he was graded the highest quarterback all weekend in the NFL granted there's still a Monday night game to go but Heineke had an 88 grade second was Justin Herbert with the 81.8 and third was Aaron Rodgers with the 81.5 also according to next gen stats Taylor Heineke had the best completion percentage over expectations with a plus 20% while Andy Dalton had a negative 18% which was the worst in the NFL just to give you the two extremes but the most important thing is that Taylor Heineke completed way more passes than we're expected which means he was throwing in the tight windows I mean it could be situations where there's pressure in his face whatever Taylor Heineke basically outperformed expected results more than any quarterback in the NFL this week and also I mean talking about how he was looking leading up to that bye week and how he's looked since the last two games he's had a 77.8 completion percentage his first eight games he had a 63.9 these last two games he's had an 8.56 yards per attempt the first eight games he had 7.04 he has a 7.4 touchdown percentage these last two games the first eight games he had a four he has zero interceptions these last two games he had a 3.3 interception percentage the first eight and he has a 127 rating these last two games versus the 84.3 rating he had the first eight i mean it's a huge turnaround it's almost night and day because the first eight games he had a couple of good games in there but overall it was just bad and you can definitely tell that that weight he added this offseason has paid off because remember all of the injury prone concerns that we had and he's never finished a game that he started fully healthy and all of that type of stuff now look at him that weight he's added has definitely paid off because i mean he's been getting hit quite a bit but he's just getting right up off the ground i mean you remember that play where it was that late hit while he was sliding he got up right into the panthers player's face and talked his trash like i'm impervious to all of the petty stuff y'all doing and we're gonna get this dub today all of that man so i felt that shout out to taylor heineke for his durability and his attitude and one of my biggest things that i really appreciate about heineke 
is that he's giving guys like Terry McLaurin a chance. My biggest gripe with everybody last season and really the first two years of Terry McLaurin's career was that they wouldn't even try to throw it to him. Granted, Taylor Heineke may make some bad throws sometimes. Maybe the throw is inaccurate. Maybe it's into good coverage or whatever. But at least he's giving Terry McLaurin a chance, man. It has to be the most irritating thing to be a great wide receiver and your quarterback doesn't even throw it your way. Regardless of what coverage is on you, regardless of what's going on, at least just throw it to me. And if one thing you can't take away from Taylor Heineke is that he's throwing it up there to Terry McLaurin. Terry McLaurin is gonna get his targets with Taylor Heineke at quarterback. But still, at the end of the day, I still feel like, of course, we need to go draft a quarterback. For me, even if you gotta trade up in the first round to get the more talented guys, because there was one drive where you got the total Heineke experience. And Mark Bullock talked about it perfectly. I mean, he said he got sacked holding onto the ball too long one play. Then he had an amazing freelancing on fourth down to convert then he had a nice run and smart slide to keep the clock running and then he had a throw where he was falling away and missed the throw that he should have easily have made if he just had better technique and better discipline with his footwork and so i love taylor heineke's floor and to me he's a good to really good quarterback especially if he could play like how he played these last two games my problem is is he going to be able to do that consistently will he ever revert back to his old self now there is an argument that this is technically his rookie season and i feel that but at the same time, you typically bring up the rookie thing when a quarterback has elite traits and he's just working to refine them. Taylor Heineke has a lot of things, of course, that you can obviously point out and improve on, but it's not like if this were his fourth season, maybe his, his arm is stronger maybe he's faster and he's really mobile i like his mobility but there's also faster guys out there as options you know what i'm saying and i don't want to spend this whole video talking about replacing heineke especially after he just had his best game ever but i just want to let you know where my focus still lies because i know people are going to be like how do you feel about taylor heineke now i still feel like we should go draft the quarterback but at the end of the day taylor heineke is definitely balling I mean, he had a QBR of 92.3 on a scale of 0 to 100. Imagine if he hit Terry McLaurin for his fourth touchdown with his QBR would it look like. And to me, I honestly feel like at the very least, Taylor Heineke should be our starting moving forward. Even if we trade up to get a quarterback, say Malik Willis, Matt Corral, any of these guys. I feel like all of those guys are going to have to sit for at least a little while, maybe a season or two. So Taylor Heineke, to me, is the dream quarterback to have while, like, say, a Malik Willis is sitting for, like, a year or two to work on his mechanics, to learn how to read defenses for the game, to slow down for him and things like that. And he potentially go from a good, really good quarterback in Taylor Heineke to a potential top five elite quarterback. Because Malik Willis, you cannot argue against the fact that he has top five quarterback traits. It's just whether or not he could put it all together and be consistent enough, accurate enough, make the right decisions consistently enough to be that elite quarterback. But if we're talking about just pure physical attributes, arm strength, mobility, and throwing potential. I mean, people act like Malik Willis is Lamar Jackson. He's a way more advanced and better thrower than Lamar Jackson was coming out of college. It's not even close. He can make literally every throw, and you can argue it's between him and Carson Strong who have the strongest arms in this class. Like, he's basically Josh Allen but faster as far as potential goes and so just imagine having a guy like that behind taylor heineke but i feel like at the end of the day i mean whether we go get like a desmond ritter maybe in the second or third round or if they do what i want to do and prioritize quarterback in the draft and trade up even if you have to to go get one like a malik willis or matt corral whatever they do either way i feel like taylor heineke should be our starting quarterback week one of 2022 i feel like he's definitely earned that much at the very least also a fun thing about taylor heineke with him playing so well against adversity and us trying to make this comeback for the season as a whole like i tweeted about who is actually good right now there is no team in the nfl that just looks unbeatable i mean maybe the cardinals are like the only team where it's like man if we had to play them i don't know every other team looks beatable everybody looks mortal there's clear tape on how to beat every team right now every top team you can literally just go back and look at a specific game this is what a team that's not even as good as them did against them and it worked for the majority of the game and worked well enough for them to pull out a win and this is not a series sport like nba like baseball where you have to play a team more than once in the playoffs to be able to beat them if you can just catch them lacking for that one game and again we have tape for every team in the nfl to show exactly what you need to do to catch any of them lacking any given time who knows what could happen in the playoffs if we were to make the playoffs and that's to my point as to like we don't necessarily have to tank to get a really good quarterback first of all this quarterback class 
to a lot of GMs, to a lot of head coaches, they feel like this is a pretty weak class, and they're even comparing it to the EJ Manuel, Geno Smith class, which I think is just highly disrespectful. But either way, I mean, it's not like as of right now, it doesn't seem like these quarterbacks are just all gonna go within like the top 10. To me, this is more like the Deshaun Watson, Pat Mahomes draft where nobody went within the top 10, but they ended up being elite quarterbacks because they went to the perfect situations for them, or at least great situations for them. Well, my fault, Pat Mahomes went 10th overall Deshaun Watson went 12th but I also feel like this upcoming draft will be a little bit deeper I feel like five guys may end up being at least pretty good you know what I'm saying but again it depends heavily on the situation they go to there's no quarterback in this class that's like no matter what situation you put them in they can go to the Detroit Lions right now and make them playoff contenders there's just not one of those you all of these quarterbacks you're gonna have to give them the right head coach the right offensive coordinator that's gonna be willing to build and change their offense around the quarterback's greatest strengths and to hide their weaknesses you cannot try to fit a square peg into a round hole with any of these quarterbacks so again I feel like the 2017 draft with Deshaun Watson Pat Mahomes ignoring Mitchell Trubisky of course I feel like Malik Willis, Matt Corral, maybe even Kenny Pickett, a lot of those guys may start to go in the early teens, late teens, maybe later in the first round. So I feel like at the end of the day, I mean, depending on what our record is at the end of the day, we may not have to trade up anyway. But again, back to my main point, you don't have to tank to get one of these quarterbacks. And at the same time, like I just said, who knows what can happen in the playoffs right now? Because the Patriots are hot right now, and they're one of the scariest teams to play. And we're also one of those hot teams. We're definitely one of those teams that if we beat the season, this next week that's three wins in a row we're gonna be one of those teams nobody wants to play right now especially if you're trying to make it into the playoffs and if we were to slide into the playoffs with this type of momentum whether it be a wild card spot or we somehow win the division we're definitely gonna be one of those teams nobody wants to play and I don't feel like this is last year where us making it to the playoffs we barely crawled in we really didn't necessarily deserve to be there and all it did was really just hurt our draft position and then that's how we've ended up with Jamin Davis instead of a Micah Parsons who's balling out just imagine this defense with Michael Parsons right now I feel like this situation is different because again the quarterbacks may go later into the draft and also I feel like this team is actually built to win some playoff games whereas last year I didn't feel like we were necessarily built to win in December or January this year who knows if we get a lot of guys back healthy and if Taylor Heineke can keep this up who truly knows also speaking of Trubisky the way Taylor Heineke's playing is also a reason why I don't feel like getting a Trubisky or a Mariota I mean wasting any resources whether it be money trade capital draft capital whatever whatever you have to do to acquire a Marcus Mariota Trubisky I feel like it's unnecessary at this point if you want to bring in a quarterback go draft one but I feel like bringing somebody to start over Taylor Heineke and pushing them back to a backup role is pointless until you have that elite guy that can take over and be a franchise guy for the next 15 plus years but that's just me again congratulations to Taylor Heineke because he's balling out now to the offensive line now the offensive line has been one of our most consistent position groups period this season you could argue it has been the best position group I mean first of all we've been killed by injuries this season when we got to the point we were on to our third string right tackle one game we're to the point where we already lost our backup center so now our backup guard is playing center right now as a starter don't let Brandon Sheriff get hurt because then we're on to our backup backup guard but all of these guys have stepped up and played very well with all of these injuries and they're still playing like a top five unit in a previous video earlier last week I showed y'all the statistics on how this offensive line has literally been a top five offensive line in spite of all of the injuries that we have right now but shouts out to Cornelius Lucas for filling in for Samuel Cosby shouts out to Wes Schweitzer for filling in for both Brandon Sheriff and Chase Roulier now shouts out to Charles Leno he, he was looking very suspect in the beginning of the season but he's been holding it down to left tackle and he's like the reason why I feel like we shouldn't have to draft offensive tackle very high in this upcoming draft because at first through the first three weeks I was like oh yeah we may have to draft offensive tackle first round maybe second round at the latest but now with the way that he's playing I feel like we can wait to address offensive tackle in like a later draft especially if we're going to draft one high you know what I'm saying we have bigger needs right now Charles Leno can hold it down for at least the next two three years of left tackle with as well he's playing right now and then most of the praise has to go to John Moscow our offensive line coach because I remember when Bill Callahan left, including me, a lot of us were wondering, you know, is this offensive line 
gonna take a huge step back you know it's hard to find a bill callahan out there but john moscow's come in and you can argue has produced even better again with the situations that we've been in you can even say the fact that we lost trent williams trent williams is still the best tackle in the nfl but this offensive line has shown that you don't need a trent williams to have a top five o line you just need everybody to play their part you need really good depth and we've done that but this offensive line is balling. I mean, the way we're running the ball right now is crazy. I mean, we have older free agents that we brought in. We have rookies. We have hurt guys. And we're just out here just mixing it all up and just seeing what works. And they go out there and ball out. I mean, the way they maul people in the run game, it's ridiculous. I mean, if you go back and really look at that game, look at how much space J.D. McKissick, Antonio Gibson, and Jared Patterson have a lot of plays where they able to get quite a bit of yardage before they're even touched by the first Carolina defender. That's also great play designing by Scott Turner. But of course, that's excellent run blocking by the offensive line. And they kept Taylor Heineke clean for a lot of that game. I mean, of course, you got to shout out the running backs for this, but 191 total rushing yards on the NFL's second best run defense is definitely a big credit to the offensive line more than anything else. And it's not like we ran the ball like that and Taylor Heineke was a lot of it. No, he had six carries for 29 yards technically all of the rest of that were the running backs just pure running game behind a great offensive line very underrated offensive line we actually ran the ball for more yards than we passed the ball for that's kind of crazy in a 27 to 21 win shouts out the offensive line man and then tight ends i mean guys are stepping up most notably john bates i mean i saw it last week against the buccaneers other than that fumble you can pretty much say that for antonio gibson a lot of games too other than the fumble john bates showed a lot of promise in that game against the buccaneers and then he came into this panthers game and stepped up big time with logan thomas and ricky seals jones gone i mean we've been talking about trying to find two dual threat tight ends for the longest that we can start at the same time we found two of them then both of them are hurt and then suddenly now both of them are gone due to injuries so now we have john bates sam is reyes and tameric hemingway as our tight ends going into a very important game and it worked out they blocked well john bates caught passes thrown towards him when we needed him most again that fourth down play by taylor heineke but most notably it was the blocking i mean john bates is down the field blocking panthers defenders like 20 yards down the field on some run plays i mean man we needed that man john bates looks like a huge gem and a lot of people called it out logan paulson a former tight end chris cooley a great tight end for the burgundy and gold me after i went back and looked at the film I mean, a lot of people saw the potential in John Bates, and I'm glad they would finally get to see him out there. It hurts. It sucks that Logan Thomas and Ricky Seals Jones are hurt. But just like if Westbrook never got hurt, Reggie Jackson would have never came into himself and become the great scorer that he is today in the NBA, at least nowhere near as soon as he did. It's kind of the same thing with John Bates. That's the silver line into a lot of these injuries. We're getting to see a lot of these young guys really grow up in front of our eyes, and John Bates is definitely one of them definitely for sure one of them samuel cosme benjamin st juice a lot of these jared patterson a lot of these rookies are really stepping up because they're getting meaningful experience they're not just in practice they're playing regular season games and they're playing in regular season games that are must wins that panthers game was a must win for us to even really even have a slimmer of hope of making the playoffs this season now the wide receivers first of all deandre carter man i mean i don't, honestly don't know where we would be without him at this point i mean he's honestly one of the best free agent signings under ron rivera that we've had you could argue he's the best free agent signing from this past offseason between him and charles leno man shouts out to this coaching staff in front office for finding such a gem because now deandre carter has a touchdown in back-to-back -back games three games in a row like what's going on he has at least one touchdown three games in a row it is crazy we brought him here just to be a special teams guy and you know we were thinking a lot of us were thinking especially me that he may not even make the roster and if he does is because he's such a great returner and not only is he doing that, he's arguably the best returner we've had for many years. He already has a kick return return for a touchdown against the Falcons, a much needed one. And now he's contributed in the passing game as well. I mean, he literally looks like wide receiver two right now. I mean, Taylor Heineke to DeAndre Carter fade route to the corner of the end zone has been unstoppable for two games in a row. And then this Panther game, they didn't do that. But Scott Turner ran a great route concept to get DeAndre Carter open. Taylor Heineke read it the whole way threw it as deandre carter was getting open he wasn't even open yet but by the time the ball got there deandre carter was wide open i mean that's just that chemistry that's 
that rapport that's that trust that's that confidence that we did not have in the beginning of this season because again we had a lot of moving pieces taylor heineke was not supposed to be the starting quarterback deandre carter was not supposed to be wide receiver too so we're just working on a lot of nuanced things right now a lot of chemistry things and we're starting to see the fruits of that we're starting to see the results from that hard work being put in all season and DeAndre Carter is definitely one of the biggest examples of that. DeAndre Carter is literally what we wanted Steven Sims to be. It is crazy. And it, just like the John Bates point, if Curtis Samuel was never hurt, granted we want Curtis Samuel healthy and back as soon as possible, but if Curtis Samuel were fully healthy this whole time, would we even know DeAndre Carter was capable of this on the offensive side of the ball? Because prior to week eight, DeAndre Carter had zero reception touchdowns in his previous 50 career games. Remember, he was in Houston for a while. Now he's caught a touchdown in three consecutive weeks so i'm not even sure if he knew he could do this you know what i'm saying so it's just like curtis samuel being gone the big silver lining to that is that we found out that deandre carter is a playmaker on the offensive side of the ball on top of the fact that he's already the best returner washington has had in years and now the man of the hour terry mcclellan i mean that's that's obvious it's to the point where it's like give terry mcclellan whatever money he asks for just hand him a blank check let him write it for himself because i mean he he's doing it all he's he's literally doing it all i mean he made arguably the play of the game when he adjusted his body to make that crazy catch along the sidelines on a third and nine to help move the ball y'all know how we've been third and long as burgundy and gold fans for years now and just third and nine we just throw it down the field for a huge game terry mclaurin making crazy catches on this secondary we're gonna get to who he's doing it against too a little bit later but terry mclaurin is balling i mean the touchdowns that he had he's definitely a pro bowler they better be running these votes up y'all better be running these votes up i know i am this pro bowl voting you better vote terry mclaurin as many times as you can and even people that aren't burgundy and ghost fan have to recognize it bro he's balling like he needs to be a pro bowler and he also deserves all of the money that he asked for because this is ridiculous i mean up to a certain point in three targets he caught all three of them but his expected catch percentage was 28%. Like these were very contested. These were very well covered and he caught all of them. Terry McLaurin ranks first in the NFL with 23 contested catches and the next closest player has 14. Come on now, like stop playing. And what's crazy too is that Terry McLaurin even pointed it out in his press conference that quote, not a lot of people know, but that was probably one of my glaring weaknesses in college. So it's something I've always constantly worked on, unquote. Like that was literally his biggest weakness coming out of college and now he's the best contested catch receiver by far in the nfl come on now like stop playing with him and i even tweeted this out i don't want to hear nothing about terry mclaurin not being a top five receiver in the nfl at this point i remember sometime during this offseason some people were talking about he may not even be a good wide receiver one not a wide receiver x at all when he's honestly a top five one at the very least you can make an argument with the advanced statistics that terry mclaurin is the best receiver in the nfl and then to my point earlier terry mclaurin is out here making the panthers secondary who a lot of people feel like is the best secondary in the nfl with stefan gilmore cj henderson a lot of these guys and he's making them look like william jackson the third and kendall fuller from the first like five weeks in the nfl season i mean he's doing this against top competition nobody in the nfl can cover and then he's making tough touchdown catches like this like look at this picture like who can make this catch like who is out here making a catch like this while their face mask is getting ripped off the like come on bro also terry mclaurin is killing the record books it seems like every week there's some type of record at least franchise wise that he's breaking and with five catches yesterday against the panthers mclaurin surpassed gary clark who had 21 for the most games with five plus receptions by a washington wideout in their first three seasons since 1950 and we still have plenty of games to play this season so it sounds like he may continue to break that record and it's just going to be one of those unbreakable records for many years to come maybe forever unless they increase the nfl season to like 18 games or more or something and even then are we going to find a terry mclaurin who knows now to the running backs first of all a lot of us has been saying that we need to run more zone running and that zone running was killing the Panthers. We had a ton of success running wide zone to the left as Mark Bullock pointed out against the Panthers yesterday. McKissick, Gibson, Patterson, everybody had nice runs when we ran wide zone to the left. And that's to the side of Charles Leno and Eric Flowers. And Antonio Gibson, Antonio Gibson, man, these fumbles, bro. These fumbles. I mean, his first quarter fumble was crazy. Remember week one versus the Chargers? Fumbled on our own four yard line. Chargers scored score soon afterwards we lost the game literally because of that week six versus kansas city 
fumble within Washington's 34. Kansas City ended up scoring off of that. Never recovered. Week 11 versus Carolina. Yesterday, as in Sunday fumbled at Carolina's 13. This time, he didn't fumble on our side. We're moving the ball. We're in scoring range to at least get three points, and we fumble, and Antonio Gibson fumbles. No points from it. That could have easily have been one of those moments, too, where our team just whole passion and, and excitement deflates. The spirit just leaves the team, and we just never recover. But we fully recovered, as you can see from that 27-21 to 21 victory. But like Antonio Gibson, these fumbles got to stop, bro. I mean, you have such crucial fumbles. These are not just in the middle of the field fumbles. These are we're about to score fumbles or you fumble and the other team scores soon afterwards because you fumble so deep within our own territory. And they're like game changing plays that we just don't recover from. And of course, Gibson leads the NFL in fumbles by a running back, of course. And so after that fumble, we saw plenty of J.D. McKissick and Jared Patterson like after that fumble, he was benched for the subsequent three series. Like, we didn't see Antonio Gibson after that first quarter fumble until, like, halftime. But when they threw him back out there and he finally got the ball again, he was running like a player that did not like being benched at all. He rushed for 79 of his 95 yards after halftime. And like John Kahn pointed out, he's one of the main reasons we found the identity that we have right now. And I'm going to talk about that later. But the Washington football team clearly has an identity. But yeah, man, we literally didn't see Antonio Gibson after the first quarter when he got benched after that fumble into the third quarter when the score was tied 14 to 14. And you can argue this game, again, outside of the fumble, was Antonio Gibson's best running performance this year so far. Because with that 95 yards on 19 carries, which is crazy, and you can even look at some of those plays like what turf toe? You know what I'm saying? He was out there juking Carolina Panthers defenders out there socks. DBs, guys that are like half his weight. He was just juking them out their socks and just making them miss with agility and finesse. He didn't even have to run them over. They didn't even want those problems. But this is the most yards Gibson has produced for the Washington football team on the ground since November 26, 2020, when he rushed for 115 yards on Thanksgiving against the Cowboys. And that's easily his best game as a burgundy and gold player. And so for this to be the best game since then is crazy because, again, he didn't get the ball an entire second quarter and a decent portion of the first quarter after he got benched. So he could could have probably even surpassed that if he never fumbled because scott turner is willing to give antonio gibson the ball in the red zone but i mean we got to the red zone antonio gibson fumbled in the red zone so he wasn't able to give him the ball because we didn't have the ball anymore due to antonio gibson but also i mean of course on top of all of that jared patterson is nice seeing him get quite a bit of touches another silver line and antonio gibson fumble he got benched we got to see more jared patterson he looked good out there we have three capable backs clearly and then jd mckissick of course man i mean just one of the best free agent signings arguably the best free agency signing since ron rivera has become our head coach man and then before we move on to the defense of course we got to talk about scott turner because i feel like he's the real mvp of this game as far as offense goes especially i feel like taylor heineke is easily top four you have terry mcloin of course arguably number one offensive line in the top four easily taylor heineke of course but then you have definitely have scott turner top four and you could argue he was the most important piece and it's crazy too because scott turner gets more love outside of the washington football team fan base than he does in it i mean you have josh norris who I believe covers the Cowboys or something, or he's just a national reporter talking about how incredible of a half Scott Turner had in the first half with us being four of seven on third and fourth down conversions and a whole lot of wide open receivers, even on obvious passing down situations, receivers are open. And the fact that, you know, one of the Terry McLaurin touchdowns, he literally designed for Terry McLaurin to be matched up against Jeremy Chin. So those are taking advantages of mismatches right there. And Josh Norris even pointed out the fact that Washington should have even more points on the board but Antonio Gibson had that fumble also something we got to give Scott Turner a lot of credit on is the fact that Washington is now 17 of 32 on third downs and four of four on fourth downs these past two games again you got to give Taylor Heineke a lot of credit for that offensive line Terry McLaurin a lot of people but it starts with Scott Turner Washington has had six scoring drives four touchdowns and two field goals of 10 plays or more over the last two games that's the most of any team in the NFL over these past two games in that span. Also, credit you got to give to Scott Turner. And to me, Scott Turner has never, I mean, he's had a lot of head scratching plays, of course. You could point to a lot of things like, what are you doing? But a lot of it's been execution. And also, to me, a lot of it is if we get a quarterback with elite traits, with a stronger arm, with more mobility, with a little bit more accuracy, then you can really truly see what Scott Turner envisions his offense looking like.
Again, Taylor Heineke's good. At times, like these past two games, he's really good to great. I'm just not sure if he can do that on a consistent level. And I'm pretty sure Scott Turner, even as much as he likes Taylor Heineke, would love to see what his offense would look like with a quarterback with a rocket arm. Just even just that alone, just a guy that could throw it seven yards down the field like a Justin Herbert. And the D-line, first of all, would chase Young out for the rest of the season. Jonathan Allen is the one leading the pregame huddle, which is really dope. I like that. And then, of course, Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne are out there playing like madmen. Jonathan Allen is still the best defensive player on this defense. I mean, it's between him and Cameron Curl. And we're going to talk about Cameron Curl later when we get to the DB group. But did you know that Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne both rank in top 10 in total pressures? And they're the only tandem in the NFL, both in the top 10. And that's really just it. I mean, the fact that James Smith Williams and Casey Tuhill stepped up so big in Chase Young and Montez Sweat's absence. Of course, Montez Sweat and Chase Young fully healthy would have done a better job, but it didn't look like, oh man, that's a defensive line that's missing two first round picks in Chase Young and Montez Sweat. Like you just never really felt that way watching that game. And that's great. Big shouts out to them for stepping up. But of course, Big shouts out to De'Ron Payne and Jonathan Allen for carrying and putting that pressure up the middle because we weren't getting a lot from the outside, honestly. And then linebacker-wise, Jamin Davis is still learning, so not much to talk about. But Cole Holcomb had a great game. Definitely one of his better games of the season. So shouts out to Cole Holcomb for stepping up. He hasn't been the most consistent guy, but when he steps up, he steps up big time. And then the DBs overall, before we get to Cameron Curl, I mean, Bobby McCain, Landon Collins, Kendall Fuller, William Jackson, everybody just seems to have much better communication. We're just not getting beat with deep balls now. And I feel like, of course, the obvious thing that everybody realized, except for Jack Del Rio until recently, that Landon Collins should just stop being a safety. It should just basically just be a full-time linebacker. And it's been working out very well. Suddenly, we don't have deep bombs being thrown against us all game, every game. But everybody's also just playing better in general. Bobby McCain is just showing a little bit better range and reaction time. William Jackson is covering better. Kendall Full is covering better. I can't wait for Benjamin St. Juice to be fully healthy because he's been pretty consistent as well. I still want to see some Jeremy Reeves, some Derek Forrest, just to see what we have in those guys before the offseason gets here. But right now, our secondary is playing very well. I never thought I'd say this after the first five weeks, but they're doing their thing. But they're being led by Cameron Curl, ex seventh round pick. And it's sad too because this stat sheet. All it says is eight tackles, but like he's doing way more than that box score shows. If you go back and look at the film, Cameron Curl was everywhere. And without him, we don't win that game, period. First of all, I like the fact that since we played against the Panthers and Terry McLaurin was out here torching Jeremy Chin and Cameron Curl was out here having very good coverage against both tight ends and Christian McCaffrey, who a lot of people feel like is the best receiving running back in the NFL. So I like the fact that Cameron Curl went out there and showed I am better than Jeremy Chin. Like, clearly, like, stop making these comparisons. I'm the better of the two, easily. And then Cameron Curl out here making plays. I mean, that fourth down tackle on Christian McCaffrey, you could probably count on two hands, if that, the list of guys that could have made that play that he made. Again, he's out here covering the opposing team's tight ends and running backs, and not just any running back, Christian McCaffrey. And then he's out here making these open field tackles to save the day. It is crazy. He even spoke about it. He said, quote, on that play, I waited inside and he ran out and I did my best to drive to him and make a play. That's great reaction skills right there. That's quick thinking. To make a tackle like that in open field is just ridiculous. That That's honestly, arguably play of the game, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And you can't deny it. Cameron Curl is one of the best tackling safeties that we've ever had in our franchise history. I mean, it's ridiculous. He's easily one of our best draft picks in franchise history. Again, with them being a seventh rounder, you could argue he's the best safety from that entire draft class and we got him in the seventh round like golly man and then before we move on to special teams got to talk about jack de rio don't know exactly what happened i don't know if he just started a different diet but jack de rio seems to have figured it out I mean, again, we're missing so many guys, most notably Chase Young and Montez Sweat, but that's not all that we're missing. And Jack DeRio suddenly has this defense looking elite again because Cam Newton had a great game. Cam Newton had a really good game. He surpassed most people's expectations, probably everybody's expectations, and yet this defense still did really well. And so now you can't say that we haven't done it against elite quarterbacks. It's still hard to say that Cam is an elite quarterback today, but yesterday he looked like he could be one of them. I'm excited to see what Cam Newton looks like moving forward 
throughout this season because he plays how he played against this defense the way he did yesterday he should be able to eat up other defenses for the remainder of this season and i'm saying this to prove the point that remember last year our defense was getting nitpicked about the fact that we didn't play against any any elite quarterbacks well now this defense has played very well against tom brady forced them into his worst game you could say of the season and limited Cam Newton as much as they could and made plays when they needed to with all of the injuries that we had and all of the penalties that super hurt us as well now first of all Jack DeRio we still got to figure out what's going on on these first drives I mean it just seems like the first drive every time our defense is out there the offense is able to just move the ball so easily and score whatever they want to opponents have now scored on seven of their opening possessions against Washington six touchdowns and one field goal that's not good but we seem to just bounce back but a 70 yard scoring touchdown drive on the opening defensive drive for us against Carolina is just not good that's not a good way to start the game but again they recovered also smart thinking on Jack DeRio's behalf again with Chase Young and Montez Sweat out we started to run more 5-1-5 defense five defensive linemen one linebacker and five defensive backs again Landon Collins is technically a linebacker but like it's working like, I mean, shouts out to Jack DeRio for making that adjustment mid-season, mid-game, all of that, and it's really working. Just imagine what that could look like with Chase Young, Montez Sweat, Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen, and Matt Ioannidis. We need to definitely start running that more often once we're back healthy. But I like the fact that he started to run it even with Casey Tuhill and James Smith-Williams to throw the Carolina offense off. But yeah, man, Jack DeRio, man, got this defense playing well. After that 75-yard opening touchdown drive for them, the next three drives for the Panthers ended in punts, and we held them to 33 yards over that stretch. I mean, the last two drives for Carolina ended with turnover on downs when they went for it on fourth down. The defense stepped up when they needed it most, and shouts out to, again, Cameron Curl for that open field tackle on Christian McCaffrey and Deron Payne for that sack on Cam Newton to end the game. And again, shouts out to Cam Newton, man, because he had a great game and that made me happy to see man y'all already know how i feel about cam newton so i hope he tears up the rest of the league for the remainder of the season but that's a big time win especially for the defense against a cam newton that was playing better than probably everybody expected and then shouts out to special teams man i mean again deandre carter doing his thing but joey sly man he is now 10 for 10 on extra points and field goals since we got him and i don't think people have noticed but we are undefeated since we picked up joey sly and all of those kicks have mattered, man. All of these kicks that we needed to make, all of these extra points, we've needed every point that he's given us these past two games. Now, one thing that I didn't like that Rivera did is that we didn't give Joey Sly the field goal attempt on that 56 yarder because he's one of the biggest legged kickers in the NFL. I mean, this guy is one of the swollest kickers. I mean, I know upper body strength doesn't really apply to this and matter for this situation, but he's one of the strongest kickers, one of the buffest kickers in the NFL I've ever seen. But he's shown you that he can kick a really long field goal. So I think we just need to learn to trust him more, Rivera, to be honest with you, because he hasn't missed a field goal kick, a PAT, or nothing since we've signed him. And it looks like we may have found our franchise kicker of the future. And thank goodness, because that has been stressful, man. Just imagine how many more games we would have won just this season alone if we had Joey Sly over Chris Blewett and Dustin Hopkins, man. At least one or two games, in my opinion. And now moving on to random. First of all, just to summarize, I like the fact that Washington Realm on Twitter, I mean, he put this perfectly. Taylor Heineke played his best game yet. The run game was phenomenal outside of the Antonio Gibson fumble. All three running backs are good are capable the defense was decent but penalties hurt them and then to add to that they stepped up and made plays when they needed to in the back to washington realm they do appear to have a kicker i agree and ron's teams play much better in november and december that's definitely a thing that's definitely a recurring thing at least for this team for these first two years that he's been here but even if you go back and look at carolina teams they just played better in november and december also the last time the burgundy and gold have won a game in which they ran for more yards than they passed 190 to 179 yesterday was last year in arizona when we played the 49ers, I know that situation still sounds crazy when you say it out loud. We ran for 98 yards and only passed for 95. Also, DeAndre Carter had a good quote. He said, we definitely know who we are as an offense right now. We're tough and physical. We're going to run the ball and we trust Taylor, unquote. And that's our identity. 
I alluded to this earlier that our identity is to just play great defense and to be the most physical team out there doing it. Our offensive line, our defensive line, we're winning through the trenches right now. And Taylor Heineke's making the plays when we need him to. Terry McLaurin is out here bailing everybody out with these crazy catches. And at the end of the day, our team's identity is smash mouth football, period. Rivera even expounded upon this saying, quote, I think we're getting a little feel of our guys, unquote. And he spoke about the fact that we've controlled the clock the last two games and there's no coincidence that we've also won these last two games. Control the clock, smash mouth football, be the most physical team, the most hard-hitting team, run the ball down people's throats, and suffocate them on defense. And like I said earlier, man, I mean, the fact that we're doing all of this in spite of all of the injuries that we have, I mean, we're one of the most hurt teams in the NFL, especially if we're talking about starters. Like a lot of teams have lost like a starter, and then that same position group, they lost the backup and the backup and the backup. We're losing starters top to bottom on the entire team. I mean, if you honestly think about it, Taylor Heineke technically wasn't a starter going into this season. Offensive line, receiver, defense everywhere. I mean, Chase Young, Montez, Sweat. I mean, we, we're we losing first round picks out here. We're losing starters, first round picks top to bottom on the roster. And we're still getting the job done against really good teams. Also, the Washington football team goes into next Monday night matchup against Seattle with a three game active winning streak in weeknight games. This is their longest such streak since they won four consecutive weeknight games over 40 years ago, 19 1974 to 1976 so if there's one thing that Ron Rivera has fixed here is that we do win primetime games when we play at night it's not an automatic loss for us like it used to be with Kirk Cousins at quarterback Jay Gruden the head coach several head coaches several quarterbacks not just don't just want to point out Kirk Cousins and Jay Gruden but since Ron Rivera has been here we actually have a chance of winning primetime games and we've won quite a bit again we have a three game active winning streak in weeknight games and that also brings me to the point that we can definitely beat the Seahawks if you've seen the way they play you see how Russell Wilson looks super immortal right now the team just honestly isn't good like I mean Russell Wilson has had that team on his back for many years and now that he's not playing well they're just getting super exposed because the roster wasn't that great to begin with anyway they're definitely a very beatable team so this is going to be a really fun game on Monday because to a lot of people we may be the underdogs but we may end up winning that game like convincingly like by like more than 10 points or something I can definitely see that also as of right now the Cardinals have the number one seed in the NFC. Cowboys have the number two, Packers three, Buccaneers four, who we just beat. Two weeks ago, Rams five, Vikings six, Saints seven. And then outside of that, the teams that are not in the playoffs, you have the 49ers eighth, Eagles ninth, the Panthers 10th, who we just beat, who are five and six. We're four and six, which puts us at 11 technically. But if we keep balling and win some games, there's definitely a path for us to make the playoffs for sure. And if you look at the rest of the season, man, Seattle is, I mean, spiraling out of control. Control. they look bad Vegas is super up and down definitely beatable and then we have five division games left the Cowboys there's a lot of tape on how to beat them the Broncos and the Chiefs have clearly shown it I mean it's not even just you know how you attack their defense it's how to stop their offense right now their offense looks so pedestrian against the Broncos and the Chiefs the Chiefs defense really isn't that good but they just came in with a great game plan they made a lot of plays when they needed to and who's to say that we can't do that as well and it's so sad too because we would be the seventh seed right now if we just simply beat the Saints I mean we gave a lot of games away there were quite a bit of games this season where you could say we lost the game and not the opponent won it but that Saints game is definitely the one where you point at the most and be like man we should have won that game so it's crazy we should be the seventh seed already we should already have a playoff spot right now and be in the driver's seat but you know things happen man but it's also crazy too because it's been reported recently that Logan Thomas and Curtis Samuel may be healthy enough to play Monday against the Seahawks. So the Seahawks may be getting the healthiest version of the Washington football team that we've seen in many weeks. So this is going to be fun. But yeah, man, shouts out to Rivera and the whole crew, man. We are 2-0 since November. We play the Seahawks November 29th, the day before my birthday. So that will be a nice birthday gift. We'll see how that goes. And if we can continue the November streak, we will be undefeated in November if we beat the Seahawks on monday night so that's gonna be interesting and also rivera gave his players another victory monday after the win against carolina the last week after the buccaneers win was the first time he ever gave this organization a victory monday in his almost two years of coaching here and now he's giving them the second week in a row and if you don't know victory monday is basically when he tells players you know you don't have to watch film you don't have to come in and do all of this stuff if you don't want to it's not mandatory until wednesday so he's basically just giving them the day off because it's not just even the win 
win is how they win he said because he didn't give them victory mondays after the falcons game he didn't give them a victory monday after the giants game but it's just the effort and it's the preparation when it's clear that the team has watched film from top to bottom player to player coach to coach when it's just like a certain level of effort and preparation shown on the field that's when he gives a victory monday again it's not just the win it's how they win but yeah man that's the end of this video please get in the comment section let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video do you agree or disagree with a lot of my points please like this video if you liked it if you learned anything also i appreciate all the support man i'm sorry i couldn't stream these past couple of days i want to stream for college on saturday and for our burgundy and gold on sundays but again i've just been really down bad i'm just happy i could even record this video today so man just stay tuned man i got plenty of content coming out and as always i appreciate all of my sponsors especially my pro bowl sponsors whose name is scrolling on the screen right now when i catch y'all later i'm out